tithing, giving 10% of our income to a church is a common theme here on the Ask Pastor John podcast, and not so much recently, but in our first decade, it did come up a lot, and you can see how uh, in the Ask Pastor John book on pages 101 to 103, if you have a copy handy. After several years, we return to that theme today with this question, can a church force tithing? The question is from an anonymous man who listens to the podcast. Good morning, Pastor John. What do you think about forced tithing? Recently in my church, there has been an expectation that our church leaders will tithe 10% of their income back to the church as a condition of their ongoing employment at the church. While I understand the importance of supporting the church financially, I've found myself conflicted about the approach being taken with our leaders. It seems to me that forcing individuals to tithe can potentially do more harm than good. I believe that true worship is born out of a heart of gratitude and sincerity mm -hmm. rather than obligation, 2 Corinthians 9.7. When Abraham gave his tithe to God, it was out of a genuine sense of thankfulness for God's blessing, not because he was compelled to do so by another person. I've attempted to discuss this issue with our leadership, and while some have expressed willingness to engage in dialogue, others seem to dismiss it as unworthy of discussion. This has left me feeling uncertain about how to proceed. What do you think about forced tithing? The short answer is that I do not think tithing is a New Testament requirement the way love your neighbor as yourself is a New Testament requirement. Mm -hmm. I think the New Testament has put Christian generosity toward the cause of Christ on a new footing of freedom motivated by the joy of seeing Christ magnified in people's lives. I think tithing was an integral part of the Old Testament sacrificial priestly system, which God designed for the support of the priesthood, a system which no longer exists in the Christian church. That's the short answer. This question is part of the larger question of which commandments from the Old Testament come over into the New Testament as binding on those who are in Christ? Thou shalt not kill is an Old Testament commandment. So is Deuteronomy 14.10. Whatever does not have fins and scales, you shall not eat. It is unclean for you. So you can eat trout, but not catfish. Thou shalt not steal is an Old Testament commandment, so is Deuteronomy 14.22. You shall tithe all the yield of your seed that comes from the field year by year. Now, not all the commandments of the Old Testament come over as binding into the New Testament. Some of them we call the moral law, which are rooted in our nature as God created us and in the nature of God's love and justice being worked out in our lives, and some of them are simply temporary as part of the priestly, sacrificial Old Testament system, which has passed away after the coming of Jesus Christ as our priest and our sacrifice. Once the people of God were an ethnic people, a political regime set off from other peoples with their ceremonial practices— but today, the people of God are not an ethnic people, but made up of all ethnicities, and are not a political regime, but are embedded as exiles in all political regimes, and are not set off from the world by ceremonial practices, but by their allegiance to Jesus Christ and the moral implications that belong to his way of saving us through love and justice. My four reasons for thinking that tithing is not one of the moral commandments that remain binding are, are these. I have four reasons. Number one, tithing was God's way of sustaining the Levitical priesthood. Numbers 18.21, to the Levites, I have given every tithe in Israel for an inheritance in return for their service that they do. That's the end of the quote. Since th that system of Levitical ministry is now gone, I think the designed support for it is gone. Second, Paul taught that when we died with Christ by faith in his death for us, we also died to the Old Testament law so that we could live in a new way 
not by law-keeping, but by spirit-motivated love informed by the moral implications of how God created us and how the gospel shapes us. Romans 7, 4, and 6. You have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. We are released from the law, having died to what held us captive, so that we now serve in the new way of the Spirit, not the old way of the written code. And then Paul illustrates this specifically in Galatians 4 and Colossians 2. He says, despairingly almost, you observe days and months and seasons and years. In other words, all those Old Testament stipulations. You you observe all that. I'm afraid I've labored over you in vain. Do not submit to rules about food and drink or with regard to festival or a new moon or Sabbath. These are but a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. I think tithing is built in to that category of shadows. Number three, I think the New Testament puts giving on a new footing of freedom motivated by the joy of seeing Christ magnified in people's lives. All of 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 unfolds this new footing, but especially chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, very famous verses, very important verses. Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, that's crucial. Not under compulsion. Nowhere in any of the New Testament letters do the apostles motivate giving by mentioning tithing which would just seem strange if that were the typical way funding of the church was to happen in the early church. Fourth, and finally, when Jesus said in Matthew 23, 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Sometimes that's used to argue about the ongoing validity of tithing, without neglecting the others. He was speaking to the Pharisees before his world-changing death and resurrection. They were living under the old regime of the Old Testament law. This would be similar to Jesus telling his disciples back in chapter 5 of Matthew to offer their gifts at the temple, or telling the lepers Go show yourself to the priests. These are commands, but they're not abiding commands because they're under that regime of Old Testament law. These are not commandments that apply after the era of the law passes away with the death and resurrection of Jesus. So my conclusion is, it's a mistake for the leaders of a church to make tithing a requirement for church leadership. I have always taught that Christian freedom, in the light of the lavish generosity of God toward us in Christ, will motivate Christians to give more than a tithe, but it will not be under compulsion because God loves a cheerful giver. Yeah, amen. Uncompelled cheerfulness must drive all of our giving Thank you, Pastor John, and thanks for joining us today for more on tithing from several other different angles. Check out the Ask Pastor John book uh, if you have a copy of that handy, and see my digest of episodes on pages 101 to 103. Well, in our Bible reading, we are entering into Job together, a book littered with errors, errors about suffering, even false statements about God himself. So how do we discern what is true and false as we read through the book of Job? Big question we need answered as soon as possible. And it's up next. I'm Tony Ranke. We'll see you on Monday.